here today we have um, uh, Dr. Silesh with us, uh, who is um, uh, who has a very uh, you know uh, great experience in machine learning, NLP, um, and and IoT etc. And he has he has been part of right, right now he is uh, working in Relanceo, and uh, he's been part of many uh, big companies like Ola, Google, Yahoo, and he had given a very good contribution in there. So sir, uh, it's, it's thank you. So, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. Satish and I go back uh, to 2015, we did a EdTech startup together, and uh, he was our engineering mentor as well as uh, uh, investor. <laughs> so when he said, can you give a talk, I said, of course, you know, for investors, everything is good. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about my own evolution of AI thinking, right? So AI is a topic that is very confusing to some people. It is, Either too much math, too much programming, so too much data, data. and um, and uh, you know, so so you know, if you ask different people what is AI, they have a different uh, you know idea about it. If you ask some people what is algebra, everybody knows, but AI nobody understands in a in the same way, right? And it's an evolving field, and uh, the idea that you know what is our AI thinking is also evolving as we go along. It's a very fast moving uh, area. And what AI used to be five years ago is very different from what it is now, right? And it's going to keep evolving, right? So, like our uh, programming thinking evolved when we went from functional programming to object-oriented programming, the idea of programming evolved, right? When we went from you know serial computing to parallel computing, our idea of computing evolved, right? So similarly, AI thinking is a concept that is evolving, and I just want to share my thoughts on uh, what that means and how do we take organizations from what I call data-rich organizations to AI-first organizations. So that's the kind of theme that I kind of uh, do for you know startup ecosystems in the country, NASCOMs, Niti Aayog, and big companies like Ola and so on. Yeah. So uh, let's see if this works. All right. So if you think about technology at a very high level, right? What is technology? Technology is nothing but a way to extend our own capacity into machines, right? So if we cannot run very fast we created cars. If we cannot see very far, we created a telescope, right? So technology is nothing but an extension of our own faculties. And you know, whether it is liver and crane, or whether it is aircraft, or it is a microphone, it's just the same thing, right? So in that definition of technology, if you think about what is AI as a technology, uh, what, what part of us is so unique that is different than all other animals, if you will, right? Every animal can walk and run and see, and extending those capabilities into machines has already been done. But what is it that makes us even more interesting than all those things? Our ability to, to think, to learn, to sort of adapt to new situations, right? to communicate with each other. So those are the new things that makes us human, which is very unique. And you know, in this definition of technology, AI is really that part of technology which extends these capabilities of humans into machines. Yeah? So car is as much technology as AI because it's just an extension of our mental capabilities. Right? So there's nothing uh, you know, uh, very uh, this thing about it. Now, if you look at technology, uh, it's evolving in many facets. And you, know, you, you guys are part of it and all that. But the idea that technology could be a set of tools uh, it could be computing technologies, interfaces, sensors. You would work with a lot of sensors. Data, the idea of data is evolving. And the idea of intelligence is also evolving. So I'll go through some of that from a historical perspective. So you get a sense that you know we are part of a long movie, and we're just a frame in this whole journey. Yeah? And the idea of what is a product is also evolving. And we'll talk about that. And what is AI thinking is evolving. And what are the data science skills is also evolving. Right? What is a good data scientist now and future is going to be different. Right? So hopefully we'll talk about some of these things. So if you look at tools, right? So tools are evolving, and you know technology is not something we started creating 20 years ago. Mankind has been creating tools as a form of technology. So if you cannot kill a lion by bare hands or cut a tree, I will create tools. Right? So tools is part of technology, and the tools have evolved to now robotic tools that can manufacture cars. Right? So tools are evolving, right? and these are very important part of AI ecosystem. Uh, the, the sensors are evolving. Right? So if you take any sensor, and say that sensor itself has evolved from a basic sensor that can look only up to the sun, 
to something that can go and see up to the Big Bang. And now we can even send these uh, satellites into space. Right? So sensor thinking is a very important construct in AI. And not only these sensors are evolving, all sensors are evolving. If you look at satellites and remote sensing, if you look at genomic sequencing, if you look at your own uh, logging system in an app, is also a sensor in some sense, right? All of this is the idea of sensors is evolving, right? Not just the, the, the machines are evolving, the idea of what is a sensor is also evolving. So in some sense, we are also sensors because the moment we make a phone call or buy something or, or take a cab, we generate data somewhere. Right? So in a way, anything that generates data is a sensor. So it's not that sensor is a physical device, it's a construct, and you know, now we are all creating apps and they are generating data. Right? So the idea of sensor is evolving, the quality of sensors is evolving. Uh, obviously, the compute is evolving. Right? So the idea of what was a computer in the 70s is very different than the 90s, it is very different than now. So today, we don't think of this as a computer, or your laptop or your phone. We think of this cloud as your computer, and these computers are there just to connect to the cloud. So what we carry with us are connectors, not computers, because all your Gmail and LinkedIn is here, not on your laptop. Right? So we understand that the idea of computers is evolving. Okay? Uh, then you know the idea of data is evolving. When we were doing PhD in 2000, data meant you know a row, rows and columns, right? And rows and columns, and we have a data set, right? Excel spreadsheets. But in the last so many years, the idea of data has evolved. Data has taken many, many shapes and forms, right? So you have uh, sequence data, you have satellite data, you have stock market data, and then the internet came and it changed completely the idea of data, right? Now we have any click and tweet and uh, post and like and up and down is all data, right? So the idea of data has evolved to a very large extent. Not only that, after the internet boom, there was another notion of data that evolved, which is the IoT data. Right? And we all are working on IoT data in some sense. So I'll give you a sense of how I think about data. So one is, if you think about the data before IoT world, so let me take an Ola example. So when you are booking a cab, right, that is a transaction. So you say open the app, you do your selection, the app, the, it gets allocated, card comes, you sit, you finish the ride, you, you do your rating and you're done. So that is one transaction. So that is one notion of data, which is transaction data. So any phone call you make or any Google search you do is transaction data where a human is interacting with the system and every time that interaction happens there is a transaction. Yeah? So that is this kind of data. So, right? But what is IoT data in my mind is like a heartbeat. So how does Ola know where all the caps are and what is their status? How do we know that? Because every cap generates a ping to Ola that says every six seconds and says, I'm here, that long, and this is my status. So that data is continuously generated without any reason, yeah? just to know where things are. So that is IoT data, right? So Fitbit is IoT data, but when you eat food and take a picture of what you're eating, is transaction data, right? So think of heartbeat of a system is IoT data, and transaction is transaction. And humans have the both kind of data all the time, right? Breathing is like IoT data and doing stuff is transaction data, right? And the, the idea of what we can do with this and that is different, right? One is very regular, one is large, one is small, and all of that, right? So we need to think about data in a very broad <coughs> sense, right? What can data be? The idea of interfaces are evolving, right? So if you look at how humans interact with each other, right? So we are given senses and facial expressions and languages and uh, audio and speech and human gestures. So we interact with each other in a very natural way. But how do we interact with machines? We open the app, then there's a menu, then you click here, you click there. Imagine if I had an app for connecting with every one of you. I'll have so many apps, right? And that won't be working, right? So now interfaces are evolving, and, and instead of touch, how do we go into chatbot kind of an interface? And for chatbot, how do we go into a speech-based interface, right? So, so interfaces are becoming more and more natural, yeah? And now think if you're a UX designer, your job is at stake because you need to be a speech expert, not really a UX designer. In the future, think about how people will interact. And if you have kids, you must have seen, nobody types anymore, right? They open Google, they press that button, and they speak it, right? So the, the next generation is not going to, they say, oh, you used to have keyboards, right? Like we worry that, oh, you used to have phones that were plugged into the wall, right? We wonder about them. Similarly, they are wondering that, oh, why is there a keyboard? Right? 
So that's how the idea of an interface is born. Okay? And knowing these trends will help us think about the future products, right? That's why this is important. Now, one of our challenges is that you know we are the whole civilization, if you will, is making a transition from an IT civilization to a data civilization to an intelligent civilization. Yeah? And you know, that is a journey that every company, startup, and uh, this thing is taking. So if you think about it, how did Google start, or how did Reliance start, or how did your company start, or how did Ola start? They all started as infrastructure <coughs> first, right? Put the plumbing in place, build the apps, onboard the drivers, you know, write a crawler, indexer, collect the data, put it on the cloud, create an inverted index, and all of that. So this is all infrastructure, right? Then what happened after infrastructure? We said we cannot scale without IT. So the IT revolution took us to the automation stage where somebody coded up the rules and said if the cab is less than five minutes, you know, allocate. Or, you know, if the number of keywords in the page is this much, put it on a high score. So the initial systems were built on a rule-based way of thinking about how to make those decisions, right? So that was the IT uh, revolution which led to automation. And when we did automation, one thing we started doing was we started collecting logs, right? So every time you do anything on the app, we started collecting logs, right? So that is the transaction data. But this was pre-AI era, right? And if you're a software engineer, if you're thinking like a software engineer, you are collecting data for two reasons. One is, if you want to debug the system and you want to know what happened, you're logging the whole thing, right? And we do your V1, V2 logging, and you can figure out what's wrong. The other reason we started collecting data was to generate reports for the bosses. They say, you know, how much sale happened in this area, that area. So we want to generate lots of reports. So that is what the purpose of data was in the IT thinking. Yeah? Now, what happened is now all the banks and all these big companies and Googles of the world and all of the world are sitting on a very large flow of data. And they are saying, oh, if reports is the only thing I can do with it, it's a waste of space. Yeah? Can I now become from a data-rich company to an AI-first company? And how are my products going to become AI-first products? So when you do Google search and it auto-suggests something, or if, if Ola doesn't allocate you the cab nearby, but something very far, it's not an intelligent product, right? And the idea is, how do we replace IT rules with rules that can be learned from the data and feedback the system and continuously improve, right? Now, one of our biggest challenges here, both for us and for leadership is, how do we think about you know, how do we wean ourselves off of this automation thinking, IT thinking, and get into the AI thinking? It's a mindset change. And that is what uh, I'll kind of keep happening. Yeah? So if you think about intelligence, right, within AI there are four layers in my mind, right? And we're going to have different variations of this. So the first layer is what we call the business intelligence, and all of you produce reports of this kind of that, right? So we can say, you know, that road is clocked this much, and there's more traffic here, less traffic here. So you can do all the business intelligence on top of it. And this is what a lot of AI companies say, mean when they say they are AI companies. So when I go to Reliance or Ola and say, what do do? They say, oh, we are an AI company and we generate 2,000 reports every day. So what they have done, they have reduced a billions of records into 2,000 reports that nobody knows how to interpret. Because now you need 2,000 people to look at 2,000 reports. So we are not yet an AI company because a human still has to look at the reports, find patterns in it, and do something about it. So we are not there yet. Yeah? And this is not how we operate. right? We don't look at our own past and say, I got this much marks in 10th, and that is good enough, and that's my report. That's not going to work. I do something about the future. So what is the next step in AI? So reporting the past is a good thing, but it's a completely useless activity. Yeah? And people spend a lot of money on tableaus and all this nonsense, and it's all a marketing gimmick. Yeah? It doesn't help anyone. Okay? So what do we do next? <coughs> Summarizing the past is not enough. What do we need to do next? And that is the birth of machine learning. So we said, look, can you not just predict the past, you know, uh, report the past, can you actually predict the future? And this is how we operate in our lives all the time. Right? We predict everything and then operate, right? So we say, oh, I'm going to start at 8 o'clock today because it takes this much time. So I'm predicting before I start doing that, right? So we predict and then we operate, right? When we drive, we predict a lot more, right? To the car, hey, this is cow is coming and all that, right? So we work on prediction. Prediction is a 
first level uh, thing about the EA. Now tell me if I just predict that this farmer is about to going to have a bad crop or this kid is about to fail the exam or if this person is going to have a heart attack with Fitbit data. If I can only predict, is that good enough? You go to your boss and say, I have predicted churn, I have predicted this, I have predicted that. Right? That's not good enough, right? So, so what do you do next? Suggest something. Suggest something, right? So now, that is, in my mind, that is data. So what has happened in the past? Why it has happened? This is the causal structure, right? Bad experience leads to churn. It's a causal structure, you learn that. Then, what can we do about it? Right? So these are three questions. What has happened in the past? What is about to happen? Why is it happening? And what can I do about it? That's it. It's all that simple. Right? And true AI is the next thing, which not many people are there yet, which is not just about optimizing your next action. It's about optimizing a series of actions, thinking about five steps ahead in the game of chess before you play the current game. Right? So this applies to everything we do. Right? Life is full of long-term decisions. Right? Career path building. Right? Your career path is a very you know long term thing. Your health is a long term thing, right? Your uh, agriculture is a long term thing, right? What you do now affects something in the long term, right? So, so AI can actually help us get there. But most companies are not here yet. Most companies are here, and we are building APIs for different kinds of predictions and actions, right? Okay, so that's kind of the AI journey. Now, what does AI do really? In a very business agnostic and data agnostic way, what are the four things? AI does for helping me make better decisions. So every business is making decisions all the time, right? LinkedIn should connect you to that person. Because, you know, YouTube should give you that recommendation, or you should take routing this way and not that way, right? So it's all about decisions that we are making, retail, everywhere, healthcare, we are making decisions all the time. Now the question is, what does AI do to make those decisions better? So I'm going to define four dimensions of better, yeah? And then you'll understand the, what role AI plays in this and where the world is moving in terms of data and decision making. Right? So the first thing we do is what I call broadcast to personalized decisions. Right? So if I, today, in the pre-data science world, what do I do? I send a Sunday circular, everybody sees the same circular, all the ads on the newspaper, and it's not personalized. Right? Our education system, right? everybody studies the same thing at the same pace from the same textbook, in the same way, gets the same homework, right? And it's a completely useless, very broadcast system. So you understand that before we had data, we would do broadcast. So, you know, agriculture is broadcast, right? Uh, healthcare is broadcast. So, you know, uh, medicine is broad broadcast, right? This take of medicine, right? So everything is a broadcast decision. And this leads to a lot of inefficiency in the system, right? So today, if I send the same set of coupons to a lot of people, the cost is low. But the ROI is very good, right? So, so how do we go from broadcast to personalized? Can I build a personalized education? Can I build a personalized? And that's what our startup was. We wanted to build, which is how do you teach math differently to different kids by understanding what they are learning and adapting the problem and the homework and the content for them, right? So, can I uh, personalize uh, education? Can I personalize farming, right? So, so you know, uh, can I send you the right coupons? If you will, so you're not a you know. Let's say you're a vegetarian. Why would I send you a chicken coupon all the time? Why would I do that? Don't I see it in my data that this guy never bought it? Very simple things, right? So things like that, right? If you open your Ola Uber apps, you know if you're in a certain place, they know where you're going to go. The drop down is very accurate, right? In the evening when you're here, you open the app, it suggests home, right? In the morning, it suggests. So that is personalized, right? So the idea is we are now making personalized decision and it is possible because we are collecting and profiling each person in a very lot of detail. Right? Second thing we are able to do now is instead of making batch decision, right? every Sunday I will do something. Right? It's a calendar based decision making as opposed to real time decision making. Right? So my favorite example is imagine if uh, you know you missed a you know missed a uh, you know airport flight because your driver was sleeping at three o'clock in the morning. Right? This happens to some of us who travel a lot. Now what do you do? So there is a bad experience trigger that has happened. As a result of that, can I react to the trigger or wait for my next Sunday circle? Right? So how do you think about trigger-based decision making? So imagine things are happening on the system all the time, 
and you're capturing data in the Kafka queue all the time, and you're, you know, like in a data flow way, you're continuously reacting to it, right? So how do we go from batch to real-time decision making, right? So you bought a printer on a certain day, three months later, I'm going to send you a very precise cartridge coupon because I know that most people need that from my data, right? So broadcast to personalize, batch to real-time. The third is, if we can predict, why are we still reacting? Today, if you look at how we deal with life, we react to everything, right? A uh, kid failed in the exam, the parents are reacting in Charo, this whole, right? Student alarm, right? If a farmer is committing suicide, you again react and do that all the things, right? If somebody gets a heart attack, then you react. Why can't we predict and then say, look, I'm going to do a proactive, right? So one of the things we are trying to do, there's a very interesting insight that in any system, let's say telecom, if I'm capturing all the sensor data and saying, this person tried to call from here to there, and the call was mute. If I know that, and I know that this is your home, and you are now you know, not getting a good signal, if I know that from my data, I should call you and say, look, I know you are facing this problem, and we are working on it, instead of waiting for you to call. So this is called proactive customer care. Right? So because we know your experience before you tell us, we should know that. Right? That's a principle in in data science and where customers are involved. And the last thing AI can do is help make what we call strategic long-term decisions. So if you look at uh, you know, agriculture, for example, right? there are a lot of subsidies on, on fertilizer and water. So what do farmers do? They put everything they can, right? So they put all fertilizer, all pesticide, and eat all that poison and all of that. And the crop becomes uh, very high yield, but the soil becomes very poor. So what happens? Strategic defeat at the hands of tactical need, right? And that is the kind of thing we want to avoid, right? So somehow, how do we go from now broadcast batch reactive tactical decisions to personalized reactive, uh, you know, real-time proactive strategic decisions? And this is a general thing <coughs> across industries, right? Whether you are Netflix, whether you are Google, whether you are your company, can we think about this foundation in how we make decisions, yeah? Okay, so, uh, Obviously, you all understand AI to a large extent, so I don't want to, um, you know, go into that kind of a detail. But now we know that AI is evolving quite well. Uh, we are at a four-year-old level in AI. That means, what is a four-year-old child can do? It can understand, you know, the data and come up with insights. It can hear and understand what you're saying. It can understand language. It can do things. It can read and understand a book. Right? And it can generate strategy, right? Children play and come up with strategy, right? So today, AI is like a four-year-old. At that level of accuracy, it can do many, many things well. The question now is, we are going to either, obviously, we are going to continue to improve this, right? So vision, speech, all that can improve. But we are now ready to build next generation products on top of these capabilities, yeah? And that's where product thinking has to come. And we need to say, how do we build the next generation products on top of this? So the idea is, now let's talk about products, yeah? And, and you know, people don't use AI. People use products which are AI enabled, right? So front end is a product, yeah? So, so now, if I ask, you know, our parents and nation, say, what did you get excited about? They'll say, oh, if somebody got a new car in the neighborhood, we all got excited about it, right? And when I was growing up, there was no TV, so we went to the guy who bought the first TV in the colony, and we all went sit there from, 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. till that do version thing will go on, right? So we got excited about those 20 years, 30 years ago, right? But now we don't get excited about TVs. TVs are becoming better, cars are becoming Teslas and all that. But that's not what is exciting anymore. Now, from an AI perspective, these products come with what I call programmed intelligence, which means if you are, you know, your uh, brake fluid is low, some light will go on, right? If your iPad is in the sun, it will become bright. So these are what we call programmed intelligence. It's kind of like instincts in animals, right? Instinctive intelligence. Animals and beings are born with them. So that is what these products are. What do you think are the next generation products that we are growing up in the last 20 years? Are they very similar? Are they just better versions of TV? Or are they something completely different? Huh? What products have we get excited. Based on our mood. Okay. Automated. Automated. Okay. 
Alexa. Products. Tell me products, not chicken. Alexa. 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 Oh, okay. Right? What else? Human eyes. Human eyes. Okay. So they're coming, right? Neon and all that will come. What else? Drones. <coughs> Don't think. Now, in the last 20 years, we have been using these products. So they have nothing to do with this. Mobile phones. <laughs> Mobile phones. Right? It's still a physical product. Touch. Touch. That's a feature. Right? But how about these guys? Right? Google, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Amazon. These are also products. We don't think of them as products because they are virtual. We don't like, get a packet and say, oh, Google is delivered by Amazon. Right? <laughs> right? It won't be chilling, right? When the coffee used to come. But now we have these products, and what we have learned in the last 20 years is two things. One is how to take one machine learning idea, right? Search, information retrieval, or recommendation, right? Or link prediction. How to take one machine learning idea and build a product around that idea at a planet scale. And as you do that, as people use these products, how to take the feedback data and keep improving your product over time. That is what we have learned. Two things we have learned. This I call crowdsource intelligence, right? So the idea is if you don't use Google or Ola or whatever, these products will not become intelligent because they started as instinctive products, rule based. But as data became useful, then Google said, oh, you know, in my previous algorithm, I was showing this result at the third phase, and this is what people are clicking. Nobody is clicking on the first two. So that is my data, data, and I need to use that to improve my product. So I will move this picture, right? So without us using these products, they will never become intelligent. Yeah? So one of the biggest problem in building an AI-first product is this. Yeah? This is the cycle we have to break. Yeah? So every company is struggling with this only. If you are a healthcare startup, you say, I know how to do deep learning and convolution networks and all that. Where do I get labeled data? Right? If I have a speech company, how do I get labeled data for what I'm saying and what is the text on it? How do I kickstart that process? Well, once I kickstart the process and we start to use them, like Google search, people will start to use it and they will come in, you know, right? So, so the, the key to all these is create, you know, uh, uh, collect data and improve these products over time. Right? That's what we have done. What do you think the next generation products are going to be? And you guys are building some of them. We don't know it yet. Are they just going to be voice version of Google and all that funny stuff? Huh? You are building those products right here. You don't think of them as products here. Huh? Product 3.0. Our kids will get excited about that. Of them, we will get excited. Why you watch them? Why you doing that? Why you doing that? Sensors. Sensors. Sensor by itself doesn't do anything. But if you put a whole thing around it, augmented reality. Uh, uh, augmented reality. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So let me talk about that, and you guys are building some of it, so you should be knowing. So. For me, the next generation products, like there is a big drastic change from here to here, there is now a big drastic change coming from here to here. Right? We are now going to talk about connected car as an ecosystem. Not autonomous vehicle, one at a time. I'm talking about the entire city connected car ecosystem. So imagine today how do you opti optimize your commute? You say, you know, let's try this, let's try that. You, all of us do our own optimization, and we know what happens. Now imagine if all cars are connected on the cloud, and they know your office and work location, they know when you want to get to office, and now they're negotiating and optimizing everybody's commute simultaneously. <coughs> right? So that is a ecosystem thinking, which is how do I think about ecosystems that we are building? So I want to think of smart cities as a product, one product. What does it mean? How do I optimize my traffic? How do I optimize my telecom? How do I optimize my water? How do I optimize my electricity? Right? Because the city is a dynamic entity. And imagine in the telecom world, people live somewhere, work somewhere, commute somehow. And now the, can the network adapt to the demands of the city? As opposed to here are the towers and that is fixed, right? So how would the city respond to the collective behavior of the people? These are the products of the next generation. And you know, you guys are building towards them in some sense, right? 
So to do this, we have to think very differently about AI. What we thought about AI here is very different than what AI is going to be here, right? So we need to now start thinking what is ecosystem intelligence as opposed to crowdsourced intelligence, yeah? Because, you know, and that's what, uh, you know, some of these next things are going to be about, right? So AI is also a mindset. And, you know, one of the problems I have with the Bhavishas and the monies of the world is, you know, they expect that like an IT software, once it is procured and installed, should work on day one. That is our expectation. But an AI software does not work on day one. It should not work on day one. If it is working on day one, it is an IT product. It cannot be an AI product. It's like the baby is born and suddenly he is speaking and dancing and all that. Right? It should not. Otherwise, something is wrong. You bought a robot or something. Right? So the idea is, how do we you know, make this shift from IT thinking to AI thinking and say it's going to take a while. And the way I would think about building an AI infrastructure is to create the right building block so that eventually it will become an AI product in terms of right? So let me share some, some ideas around that. Right? So how does this work? So what is intelligence and how does it grow over a period of time? Right? So I want you to imagine there is a reality of a city or a reality of a customer base. right? So let's say Hyderabad is a city and there is a reality of commute in Hyderabad. Right? So we understand that there is some reality. We don't know that yet. Right? It's a complex reality. Now imagine that Ola has a sample of that reality. Uber has another sample of that reality. Metro has another sample of that reality. Right? Autos has another sample. Right? You understand now that is the idea of sample of that reality. Right? And using that data, we try to infer or reverse engineer what that reality might be. Right? And that's what we are trying to do in machine learning and AI. We are saying here is an observation, something fell. The apple fell and the moon you know, did not fall. So that is an observation. We reverse engineer the laws of gravity. Basically. That's all we are doing from in data science. Right? Now, what happens as we go through this cycle is we continuously discover new knowledge and we keep refining existing knowledge. So, uh, you know, one way to look at it is, so if your kid has never seen a goat before and you take her to a zoo and show her a goat and she will say, oh, this is the dog and it's a new entity now, right? So then the mother says, no, it's a goat and this is how a dog and a goat are different. So now what we have done, we have discovered new knowledge, right? And we do this all the time. When we learn new words in a language, when we learn new idioms, when we learn new things, right? Child is growing, initially it knows only mama and papa, and then it knows this, then it knows this, then it knows that, right? So we are discovering new knowledge all the time, and we are defining the idea of an existing knowledge also all the time, right? So initially, when you see a dog, which is a normal dog, you, you have a certain idea of what is a dog. But then you see a poodle, and you say, oh, this looks like a cat. And then the mother says, no, this is not a cat, this is also a dog. Now what you've done, you've not discovered a new entity, you have refined the idea of what is a dog, right? So we do these two activities all the time, right? We may discover new customer segments, we may refine existing customer segments. Whatever you are doing, you are doing these two activities all the time. But extracting knowledge is one part, and then you generalize that knowledge, and this is your model of reality, right? So Metro has its own model, Uber has its own model of that. Similarly, Flipkart and Amazon have their own model of what is the consumer behavior in this, right? So we understand this idea, sample data leads to an approximation of the reality. Right? Now, what makes AI really work is that when the next data comes, you utilize your previous knowledge to interpret that next data. This is your inference. Right? So think of this as training and inference. And now, you know, this is why when you read the same book five years later, what happens? You interpret it differently. Why? Right? Because now the data is the same. You're reading the same book. But now your knowledge about language and you know paraphrasing and you know idioms and sarcasm and all that has grown. So now you interpret the same Harry Potter differently. When you go further, you will do the same thing, right? So that's why so think of this system, and we need to think not from input to output, but the learning loop. And this part people don't get. They think this is the data. I'm going to build a model and I'm done. It's not that. It's also about the feedback loop, which is critical, because that is what will build your model better and better over time. Yeah? OK. So what is uh, uh, AI thinking? So let me talk about how I changed my idea of, of AI thinking. So when I was working with companies like Google and, and Microsoft and all of that, 
uh, and banks and all that in the before, I saw that they were all building what we call collections of models, right? So there's a the market segmentation model, there's a churn model, there's a credit scoring model, there's a fraud model, right? Uh, all these models were silos of data, silos of models. They had nothing to do with each other, right? Google is also like that. There's an ad model, there is a search model, there is a Gmail, okay, thank you model, there's a YouTube prediction. It's a collection of models, right? So that is how the old world was. And then what happened? When I joined fleet management kind of a work, then I realized that we need to now start thinking an ecosystem of models and not just a collection of models. So the idea is, what is your AI architecture? Like you have a microservices architecture where services use other services, and you know, then there are front-end services. What is your AI architecture? So what models produce something that becomes an input to another model, right? So imagine you are doing allocation of a cab to a customer. This model is about driver model that says driver is a rude driver and customer is a female customer and all of that. And this model is like, you know, you know, the price sensitivity of the customer or ETA sensitivity of the customer. Now, so these are also models and now all of that goes into the allocation, right? So you see that there is a series of models. The machine learning is not about let's build one more model, independent of other things we are building. So start thinking, if you want to build a star, smart city, your models will have to talk to each other. Now what is that ecosystem of models is what we need to start with. That is your evolution in AI thinking. Before you start building each model, define your APIs very clearly, and then you say, okay, this model only does this, this model only does that. And then they cascade together to produce yeah? All right. So now, uh, how many of you have tried to take AI courses? No? Maybe on the other side, right? But you know, if you go and say AI courses or machine learning courses, there are like 5,000 courses, right? And you go machine learning course and then after three days of watching that video by Andrew NG, you're like, okay, done, I'm done. I can go back to Java or something, right? And, and so what I'm going to do is give you a very quick uh, crash course, but more importantly, I'll tell you why we have so many algorithms and what is the overall architecture of AI. So uh, there are lots of different kinds of machine learning algorithms, right? So some algorithms are just summarization algorithms. So what they do, they take lots of data and they summarize. So what they do, they build clusters, if you So now this is clustering done on a large US retailer based on what you buy. So this group of people buy these products. This group of people buy these products, right? Not by RFMB, but like. Now what can you do with this? Now suddenly, remember those broadcasts to personalized? So now, instead of sending everybody all coupons, you can send the right coupons, right? So there are many such things you can do with very simple things like this, right? So how do you summarize a large amount of data into a small number of clusters is a very general theme in machine learning. We do this all the time. We put people into buckets, right? Male, female, rude, heavy, you know, all these buckets we put people in. We do trusting all the time. Now, one of the projects we did with, uh, with uh, your company here through ISP, was around this, which is we got these paths and the, you know, the, what is it called? The traffic score on every path. And we said, what do you do with that data? So the first thing we did was, we said, let's cluster it in such a way that for every path, what we did was, throughout the, whatever the data time frame was, we built a profile, which said, you know, how do you, how much is that value, the, the traffic value, uh, across the day. So we have a 24 dimensional data. Every hour, we compute the average you know, traffic on that. So now every path is now a 24 dimensional vector and we clustered. And we found some very interesting clusters there and you know, in the next talk somebody can share that. Right? So what we found was that certain parts are you know, one way streets in the morning. There was high traffic in one direction and low traffic on the other direction. Right? And in the evening it was reversed. Right? So, so we found patterns. We found that somewhere it's all the time like throughout the day. Somewhere it's only during the peak hours. Now what can you do with that kind of insight? For every insight, we made suggestions. We said, look, if you have this kind of thing going on, direction matters in when the peak is, what can you do? Open the other. Huh? Open yeah. the other. So you do adaptive living. So you say, instead of saying two lines there, two lines there all the time, how do you do adaptive learning? By just looking at that kind of a cluster, 
right? So, so now if I go back to the government and say, hey, you know, these are the areas you can do adaptively. Pointing, you know, three lanes to one and only link to one to three, right? Very simple question can give you that. How do you detect where to build the next flyover? How do you detect where to remove a U-turn, right? So think what actions based on what insights, based on what data, yeah? So that's how the AI thinking works. It just produces solutions to the problems of traffic or whatever through simple techniques, right? We now have algorithms that can understand language to a way, in a very interesting way. So this is the data on Yelp reviews, which is like hotel reviews. And we train the machine learning model and say, now tell me the meaning of the word ambience. Ambience, we all know, right? So ambience is not a simple word. You have to actually feel the ambience, and then you will know what an ambience is, right? I cannot teach the kid what is an ambience. I'll take him to a good ambience and a bad ambience, then they will understand, right? But machine actually figured this out, that ambience means music playing in background, cozy atmosphere, laid back atmosphere, very trendy. And how did the machine figure out? Did it actually experience good ambience? No. So here is another learning, right? So what it did, it looked at how people have described that experience, many, many people, and it doesn't know that it is English. It doesn't even know that. It doesn't know the dictionary also. All it is looking for is patterns, and this is probably what children do when we are young. We just, we don't know what the parents are saying, but there is a sequence, and from that, if the dad says, I'm going to Abraha Dabra tomorrow, it could be a place or a city or a location, right? That's how we interpret because context gives us meaning. So that philosophy now we can use to understand uh, words and, and sentences. So if you have text data, you can do a lot of that. Uh, we can also extract knowledge, right? So our language center, what it does is it doesn't, it converts this as soon as possible into what we call a knowledge graph. So knowledge graph is an internal representation of how we understand language. Yeah? Because the world is actually not made up of documents. I think for the last 20 years we have thought that the world is made up of documents and YouTube videos and tweets and posts and blogs. Actually it is not. Right? Those are just ways of communicating knowledge. This is the knowledge. The knowledge graph thinking is another way of thinking which says uh, there are entities and there are relationships between entities, how do we convert this to that? And if I can do that well, then can I say this knowledge graph in Russian now? How do you convert knowledge into language? So language to knowledge, knowledge to language, is what our uh, you know, brain does. So machines can do that. We can interpret images, videos, you know, all kinds of IoT data now and build all kinds of things. So today machines can do vision and you guys know all about it. Uh, we can also understand text at a very deep level. It's not what words are present and how many times. It's not like that. What we can do, we can say what are the entities about which this review is, which aspect of that entity are we talking about, and when is it positive or negative. And the fact that there is a word no here doesn't mean it's negative. That is the level of interpretation that is possible. Yeah. So like humans can understand this tweet, there's no such thing as positive tweet and negative tweet. We always talk about which entity, which aspect, and then what's in it. Right? So we can interpret things at a deep level. We can do predictions all the time. So these are all prediction models. We can do all kinds of recommendations. Right? And we can do all kinds of reasoning as well. So reasoning is about you know long-term reasoning. Right? So how do you think about you know how do you start here and then do this, do that? So this is what we built in our third in the third week build a reasoning system that can take a problem and use the knowledge of mathematics to say this is possible, this is possible, this is possible. It's like traffic, right? It's like maps. And then, you know, you find out the shortest path to this. So there's no difference between maps and mathematics, right? It's the same thing, yeah? So these are all reasoning algorithms. And then we have something called reinforcement learning algorithms and all of that, right? So I won't go into all that, but now the question is, you know, and there are a lot more, we just sampled a few. So now the question is, where do all these fit? Why do we have so many algorithms? And what is the top-down view of AI, right? And without knowing that, if you go bottom-up and say, let me learn clustering, let me learn classifier, you will be very confused. Because it's like, you know, learning one tree at a time without knowing what the forest looks like, right? So I want to give you the top-down view, and then you'll understand how all these algorithms fit together. Yeah? 
So what is the architecture of intelligence? Yeah? So if you look at your own self, we are also intelligent, some of us are, right? <laughs> right? So some of us are intelligent. And we respond in a very interesting way. So what do we do? We have stimulus data coming in all the time, right? So you have stimulus data. So Fitbit is stimulus data. Your SMS coming in your, uh, you know, bank SMS is coming in stimulus data, right? Uh, IoT data is stimulus data. The satellite data is stimulus data. So we're getting stimulus data all the time. Now the first creative process in AI is to convert the stimulus data into a state vector. This is where domain knowledge needs data. Yeah? So if I go to a doctor and say, look, I'm collecting the electronic health record of the country. I know the environment you live in, the water quality, air quality, the food, your lifestyle, your genetics, your past, this thing, your family history. Let's say I got all of that in my stimulus data. I go to a doctor and say, what can you tell me about this person? So he'll not, he will say, I'm going to now create his cardiac health score or his emotional health score or psychological health score or liver health score, gastric health score, right? So summarizing all that data into a state of health is a very important transition. Now imagine doing that for traffic or doing that for any kind of system, can you first think about state that you want to define something, right? So if I'm getting a lot of Fitbit data, I can do the same thing. If I'm getting a lot of SMS data, what can the banks do? There are 200 startups in India now. All they do is they monitor your SMS and they tell you what is the state of your financial health. They can tell you that your civil score is this much, your capacity score is this much, because your SMS is telling them, right? You have now reached the limit of your credit card, right? You're not paying, reminder, reminder, reminder. So now they can tell what is your discipline score. You understand? So converting stimulus data into a state vector, which is very meaningful, is the first creative process in AI. We're not talking about a classifier or a clustering. I'm saying, think from a domain perspective and saying healthcare, agriculture, how do you think about the state of the entities in your domain? So if road is an entity or a tower or a whatever is an entity, what is the state of that? What do you do once you know the state? Then you say, if you are in this state, what is the best action I can do? Right? So if a customer is a loyal customer or angry customer or high value customer, what can I do? Is the next thing, right? So it's the same as what is the state of the chess board? Am I in a strong position or a weak position? What action should I do? Everywhere you can apply this thinking. And then what happens? You synthesize that action and then you get a response, right? So you go to a doctor, you show him your blood report and your you know your symptoms, that is stimulus state. Then he diagnoses you and says this is your state of health, liver crap, whatever the problem is. So then he says this is the problem. Diagnosis. Then what does he do? More reports, more tests, or you know, here is a medicine, surgery, whatever. And now if you don't take the medicines right, you may or may not get the right response, right? So it's a stimulus response system. Now this system up till now is not an AI system. It is still portable as an IT system, right? I can hire a bunch of engineers and domain experts and convert stimulus data with a bunch of rules and say so that is the state and again a bunch of rules. So this is still an IT system. What makes it an AI system is the feedback loop, right? And we talked about the loop again and again. So the idea is, how does the doctor learn after graduating from medical school? Still he is learning, right? So with feedback data, he says, oh, I tried this medicine, the patient did not get well. Right? Or Alexa says, oh, I don't understand what you're saying, can you repeat that? Or Alexa gives you the wrong answer, then you correct Alexa and say, no, that's not what I want, I want this. So the feedback loop is what makes, uh, and if you can learn from that feedback, your system of analysis, did you diagnose the problem correctly, right? Did you come up with the right action? Did you manifest it in the right way? And you learn these three systems over a period of time, right? Now, all of AI can be grouped into two kinds of things. So either you are building these models, which is stimulus to state, right? When you're first doing something, when you're doing demand forecasting, when you're doing all that good stuff, you are really building a state model. And when you are optimizing something on top of it and say, how do I convert state to uh, action, you are building another class model. That's all there is to AI, right? This one slide captures all of AI in, in, in a very simple way. And now, when you study clustering, you will know why you are doing clustering, right? Because you are building a stimulus to state.
I'm summarizing a path in the road in 20 different types, right? Okay, so we understand that. So there is an architecture of AI. So now the question is, you know, and this question is very relevant for startups, right? In this whole picture, what is the most important part? Yeah. Is it the ability to learn this, or this, or this, or this? Right? No. Right? Feedback data is what makes you better. Right? So if I think about it, and you know, there's this uh, movie, right? Uh, what is this? Incredible. Incredible. Right? And there it says something very interesting. When I heard it, I could not sleep for three days. I said, this is very, very profound. And it applies to a lot of things. And he said, you know, like when everybody is super, nobody is. Yeah? What does that mean in an AI context is the following. So if you're a startup and you go to a VC and say, look, I can scale to millions of customers on day one. He'll say, get out of here. Everybody can do it. Because we all have access to cloud. Right? That is not your unique selling point. OK? Now, do you have better techniques? Do you have better machine learning algorithms than the others? No. Because the open source revolution in AI, everything is available to everybody. And you are using the same ImageNet that another guy is using. You cannot claim your image that is better than you, right? Do you have the same big data paradigm, right? We all have Spark and Hadoop and all that. So nobody today can say, I am better because of these reasons. Now, what will make you different than others? The, con the context yeah. which we apply to. Uh, the context we apply to, right? But if, uh, yeah, so either you have a unique product, but obviously anybody will copy it, right? No immediately after that, right? So there is Swiggy, then there is Food Panda, then there is Zomato, <laughs> then there is this, then there is that. And then there is a whole bunch of them, right? So from an AI perspective, what makes you a unique AI company? Why is Google different than Bing? Why is Amazon different than Flipkart? Data. They all have the same reality that they are something, right? So they have data. Ah, data. So they have their own labeled data. And this is the difference people don't understand. If I want to build a search engine today, can I not buy all this stuff, right, with Satish's money, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, download all that, build a browser, everybody knows how to build that, right? Why would I never beat Google? Because already the web is not the data we are talking about. The satellite data that satellites are collecting is not the data we are talking about. The census data is not the data we are talking about. That is not data. Labor data is data. So in the Google world, what is labor data? Search data. Search data. Search data. Search data. Ah, click, right? Click. And click data is what is more important. So why Google is Google is because it has the largest amount of click feedback data. Remember the feedback thing, right? Now if Ola and Uber are sitting on this data, they are scalable and all that, but they are not able to use their data to say where do people go, where do they go on a Monday at 9 o'clock, what are the you know, patterns in the data. If they're not able to do that, they're not utilizing this data. Right? So in the AI world, when we say data is the new one, this is we mean labor data is the new one, or your data is the new one. Right? And that is a very important thing. In, in fact, now. there are now companies which yes. in Bangalore they're just doing this, like a yeah. BPO business, it's called label yeah. business. Yes. They take a video, uh, say this is a dog, this is yeah. a this. So they're only labeling, they're taking some ten paisa per the annotation, they call it this annotation business. So. And Niti Aayog has identified that as one of the sectors. Correct, that is the sector itself will come. It's called is taking the data, all your job is to label, label. Remember we were talking about saying yeah. that. And Hyderabad is also full of that. You know, Google offices here are full of people who are only labeling data, right? And how does that work? You don't label everything. You label what a machine cannot identify. Right. So the machine is confused 50% this, 50% that. That goes to these people, and these people then manually label. It's pretty much like, you know, the junior doctor doesn't understand the patient, so he goes to a senior doctor, it's the human, and then he learns from that, and now next time he doesn't have to go there. So now he goes for a harder one. Right? So that's labor data is the key, and all startups are struggling with this, and saying, how can I beat Google or, or Alexa or Speech or anything, because they have already kick-started that process, people are using their product, and they're ahead of the feedback labor data. Yeah? All right. So uh, another very interesting movie that we should watch. Let's talk about movies. <laughs> is Alice in Wonderland. It's a very beautiful thing. And you know, a lot of times people ask me, you know, I want to be a data scientist. Should I learn Java, or no, Python, or R? 
Have you heard that question yeah. before? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure that everybody has the same question for us. <laughs> right? right? And I asked them in my, you know, every day at least one response I copy paste. I said, did you write this message on a Windows machine or a Mac? <laughs> <laughs> you understand how dumb that question is? Yeah? So data science is not about R or Python. It's a way of thinking. It's like saying, should I program in C++ or Java? Yes, there are minor differences, but essentially they are object-oriented language, right? So here, really data science thinking starts with, you need to know what you are optimizing, right? So in this, the, you know, the Alice is lost and says, which road should I take? And the cat says, where do you want to go? And she says, I don't know. And then she says, then take any road, it will take you there. <laughs> so you don't know where you want to go. You can take any road, it will take you there. So what happens today? All these uh, people, you know, the CXOs and CEOs, they just read all these blogs of AI this, AI that. Chalo, bhai, AI cut there. They don't know what they're meaning by it, right? So the idea is the job of the data scientist is first to define what the hell you want to do with this. And, and you know, so for example, how do I even define what is the churn of a customer in telecom, right? If you are a weekly renewal customer and you didn't renew your data plan for the last two weeks, I have a problem. You could be churned. But if you are a monthly or yearly customer and you didn't uh, renew your thing for two weeks, that is not necessarily churned, right? So even defining what is the metric I'm trying to optimize is a very difficult thing. Google spent years, years together, not on building crawlers and indexers and search engine. It spent years only on this. What is a valid click? Because for Google, a click is the gold one. And if you cannot define what is a valid click, I'm done. And the next story goes like this, that when you know Google wants to control the end-to-end -end pipeline of the click data, right? Now, when the PC world was full of Internet Explorer, what is happening is, and Microsoft wants to start a Bing search engine, and it wants to start from scratch, where will it get labeled data in the beginning? It hasn't built a search engine yet. So what is possible? That Internet Explorer, you go to Internet Explorer, you do Google search, and now Internet Explorer can capture what you're querying and what you're thinking. Right? So now there's a leakage of labeled data. Right? And that is what made them think about Chrome. They say we need our own browser. Right? So our Windows, we need our own browser. Then they said, okay, world has moved from PC to mobile first, right? Now what do you need to do? You say, oh, mobile, right? There is Nokia, there is this, there is Windows OS, and all the other Samsung OS. We need to now capture the mobile uh, market because there's a lot of quick, you know, searches happening there. How do I now capture the uh, mobile market? Chrome is not going to work, Android has to be created. Right? So now he said, we need our own Android operating system for mobile. Then they said, oh, you know what, if you're still having a Samsung phone using an Android operating system, Samsung can still take away your data at the lower level. Right? Yeah. So now what do you do? You say, I want my own phone also. Oh, so Google has not built a phone because it wants to go into the phone business. It has only built a phone because it wants to control the generation and capture of Click data. That is how important click data is. So this is how data companies think. Right? And that is why Sundar Pichai had that foresight that we cannot lose our data at any stage. So we need our own phones, our own OS, and our own. Therefore, we can be better in this. Yeah? And uh, you know, um, so all these companies think very deeply about, let's say, what is the interaction between a product and a person? Right? Okay. Did you read a review? Did you write a review? Did you? spend time on that page? Did you search for it? Did you browse it? Did you turn the problem? All this is like 20 types of interaction and they capture all that, right? So this is what I call sensor thinking. So you are not building products, you are building sensors. So in my world, Google is not a search engine anymore. It's a sensor. Paytm is not a wallet. It's a sensor. It knows where you spend money, how much, or what kind of things, right? Banks are not just banking systems. They're sensors. This is a very important transition in AI thinking that we don't build products and services, we build sensors. Yeah? And now we are surrounded by sensors. Yeah? Now, what is a template for AI journey? Right? So in any domain, if you want to think about how do I make an AI journey, how do I think about it? So there is a very standard template now. Right? And the template goes like this. So imagine you are a vacancy of AI and you go to any business. What are the five questions you are going to ask? Them? It's the same five questions. First question, what are your metrics? So if I want to optimize my refinery, 
I'm going to ask these questions. So what are your metrics? So they're going to say, look, I want to minimize unscheduled shutdowns. I want to maximize the lifetime of my FI. What is the domain knowledge you have? Right? So you say, I know the physics and chemistry and fluid dynamics and all of that for every part. And right? Then I'll ask them, OK, what is the stimulus data you're collecting all the time? Right? So then they'll say, I have all the IoT data you need, input, output, composition, and all of that. Right? Then my next question, and this is where the first creative process is. We said, how to convert this stimulus data to a state? So how do, I, how do I define the state of every part of my refinery? So I say, look, can I predict you know, what is the efficiency of the part? Can I say, when is it going to break down? Right? So I can now, using this IoT data, I can predict all of that and have a state vector that says, this is the efficiency, this is the life before it dies, and whatever, right? this is the energy consumption. So you can think about these 20 parameters that you can compute from this data. How will you do it? As a data scientist, you will not do it. You will do it because you're sitting with a domain expert. He's going to tell you. So, and then you will say, okay, in this data, can I compute that? And then you're going to say, okay, now I've defined the state. Can I now define what to do, right? So this is machine learning. This is data science, right? Remember, we talked about state discovery from stimulus and response. And then we'll say, okay, how do I increase temperature, decrease temperature on different parts to make sure my state is a good state? I want to go back to a good state of that. Right? Uh, I apply exactly the same mindset in every domain. So if I think about retail, again I do the same thing. What are my metrics? Offline or online details are different metrics. What is my domain knowledge? What is the data I'm collecting? Point of sale data or the big transition there. Then how do I define the state of every entity in my business? Who is my entity here in retail? A customer, a store, a product, a region, right? All this is my entities, and how do I define state of it? And then how do I define actions on top? Similarly, agriculture, I can do the same thing. What are my metrics? So now, Prime Minister wants to double the farmer income. So we're very clear on it. Now you break it down and say, okay, reduce the cost of agriculture, increase productivity of agriculture. Right? These are the two things. And then, how do you convert that? Now, there's enough domain knowledge in agriculture, right? The largest domain knowledge in any field is in agriculture. This is the first business we have been doing, right? Before IoT or we have been search engine just came, right? 30 years ago, right? So we have the largest domain knowledge here, but what is the problem? Why is agriculture not an AI first business yet? Cannot forecast. Huh? Forecast the weather. Forecast the weather, weather is bad. Right? You cannot predict right? few things. Few things, right? Now, so that is the problem, that we don't have good stimulus data. Think about logging for a second. When you build logging systems for your apps, you know, Amazon logs so much, Google logs so much. What does the farmer log? Do we know that in the last 70 years, which farm grew which crop? What was the practice? When did he fertilize? When did he put this water and all that? What was the yield? What was the income? We have no idea. So the stimulus layer is completely missing, right? So the first thing in this ecosystem is not to say what is this, what is that, but to say what is this? Right? So can I bring weather, remote sensing, soil IoT, all of that together and build a very solid stimulus layer? Right? And using that, I can now build the state of the health of the crop, the health of the soil, the you know, financial health of the farmer, the state of the tractor. Right? Every entity in the agriculture business, I can define a state of okay? because I have the stimulus state. This is the creative process. This process is missing in agriculture. Yeah? And then we can say when to do precision crop, well, you know, when to put what on what crop, right? Can be given to the farmer because the satellite sees that your crop is behind, knowing when it was grown and the NDVI values are lower or whatever. So it will suggest to that farmer put more fertilizer. The, the system sees that tomorrow it's going to rain. You have just watered the plant. The moisture IoT is telling me the moisture content. I know you are growing this crop. It is at that stage of development. The domain knowledge tells me, don't put water tomorrow. So I can give him water. Today what happens? Oh, this is what they do today. That is how broadcast our thing is, right? So if I want to change agriculture, I need to think about this layer and then this layer. Yeah? And you guys can play a lot of role in all of this, right? Uh, urban and smart city is one, but smart agriculture is a very big area. Yeah, no, we, we are doing that. Doing that right? yeah, yeah. So amazing stuff. I would like to learn what you guys are doing, and everybody is doing. Now the problem is with stimulus. There, there is no stimulus. Knowledge is missing. Outcomes are missing. Yes. 
So they ask us to deliver state and response. We <laughs> start calculating. <laughs> so don't worry about you know yeah. uh, this, but yeah, have, have a view of. We started uh, putting crop sensors in place, mm -hmm. uh, moisture sensors yeah. and uh, pH sensors. We just started putting those sensors. In right. Place. And same thing in healthcare, right? So uh, all your fitment and all that is sensor thinking, right? So another area we were working on in the startup was the education. Oh, what topics to learn before what topics and after what topics. So I have what we call pedagogy in, in, in education. So I know that. Right? What I don't have again is the stimulus. Today what happens? Kids do their homework in the copy. Teacher sees it, parent sees it, red green, red green. Trash at the end of the year. There is no label data collection. Now what we did in the app was we started thinking about this part of education and we said, hey, how do you collect everything that you can on a digital version of a uh, slate? So you give him a problem and he spends more time on a step from I to I plus one, right? He does a wrong thing. He, across problems, he's saying minus of minus, he's missing that. So I can now observe and I can you know, create a profile of the student using all of that is the state. Right? What concept is the student good at? What is not good at? And now I can use that to personalize what? Homework and content and what you should study. Right? If one kid is good at something, give him the next thing. If one kid is struggling with something, give him the same thing again. Or go to the field. So now we can do very fine teaching. Now just imagine why is a great doctor a great doctor or a great teacher or a tutor is a great tutor? Because he has label data, right? He's taught many students, he's seen many patients, he's seen all kinds of diversity. That makes him intelligent. Now imagine this. A tutor can teach only 1,000 kids in a lifetime. Well, what can this system do in half a day? If we have millions of kids on a single platform, crowdsource intelligence will happen. We are going to learn the hell out of education. And then it will be so precise, everybody does a different homework. And you know they reach the same level of efficiency. Right? So you know one of the things we keep challenging ourselves is, we keep thinking, how do I transition the current education system into a digital education system? That's the wrong way to think about it. You cannot take a 200 year old system and just incrementally transform it. What you will get is a Baiju's and a Khan That's not what we are saying. What we are saying is, imagine you were born today in an era of AI and devices and connectivity. What would you create an education system in this era from scratch? Unless we think like that, we are not going to create a teaching machine for the world. Okay? So, so that is how we need to start thinking about what we can do. Okay? So the last thing I want to talk about is how do I democratize AI for the country? Right? And this is where I think a lot of startups will be very happy because if this works out, then I'm going to need your help from this. Uh, you know, uh, sure. stuff. So, uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm evangelizing this idea and getting feedback. Right? So uh, what does an AI ecosystem mean in India, right? So think about this. So you have all these sectors that have to be improved, right? So you have government, space, defense, mobility, environment, healthcare. Each of these sectors have certain beneficiaries of that sector, right? So in the healthcare world, patients, doctor, hospital, insurance companies, right? They need to know. So vaccine guys need to know what's going on in the health of the country, right? Okay. Now if I take hospitals, they're using a bunch of apps and products, right? This could be backing systems, you know, insurance systems, fraud systems, what have you. So you have a bunch of things, doctor appointment, impact, and all that, right? Now imagine a product, he's going to need services, right? We are all engineers, we understand this. So it's going to need user link, right? Your electronic health record, how do I put it in one place, right? Content of medical thing, all the software I need, AI I need, data collection, sensor thinking, you know, right? And then, if I look at AI alone, I can say, you know, I need speech, vision, language, IoT, learning, reasoning, optimization. I need all these AI capabilities. My question to you now is the following. See, we keep thinking reusability in software, right? Now, if I have built a speech-to-text model in Bengali, can I reuse it again and again for OEO and Ola and Uber, right? Can I do that? Reusability across companies. Today, what happens? Google builds a bunch of models, everybody uses them. But you know, uh, there's a this thing. So now my my vision is that if I have to think about a bunch of vision models, who is going to be a provider of those? So I'm going to say, look, big companies like Google and all that will be 
very important providers in those areas. Right? Then research institutes, and you know, IIT Kharagpur has the best, let's say, Bengali speech to text model. Uh, Triple IT Hyderabad has the best Telugu speech to text model, whatever, right? Education institutes, startups, freelancers, students. You're doing a BTEC project in a college, you have a brilliant idea. You can now, can you actually contribute to the healthcare of the country by plugging in your model into a marketplace such that consumers <coughs> of that can use it, right? So when you go buy, uh, you know, food, you don't care who grew the potato and who grew the tomato, right? You just have a dish assembled at you, right? That's what these products are. So you don't care who gave me this AI or that AI cost, right? So, so this is what we are thinking about, which is how do I galvanize the AI ecosystem in the country, right? So what's happening? Startups don't get enough data, and they struggle with the data problem, right? They don't get customer, they don't get VC money, and they die, right? So what we are thinking is, how do I divide the world into AI consumers and AI producers? Yeah. Now AI consumers are your Ola, 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 and all that. They have nothing to do with, you know, speech, for example, right? They don't care. That's not their main thing, right? So they are there, but they need a lot of AI APIs. So imagine if I create a marketplace or an AI exchange, like your stock exchange. Imagine an AI exchange where I define standard APIs for all things. So in speech one, I can define a bunch of speech APIs, right? Detect language, detect accent, you know, convert speech to text, convert speech to person, right? Authenticate with speech. So I can define a bunch of speech APIs, a bunch of vision APIs, a bunch of question answering APIs. So I have already predefined them, and that API is what these guys are going to consume. They don't know who produced it. They're just consumers of that, right? And then what will happen? These guys will produce and compete for those APIs. So what they will do, they will say, look, I am a IIT Kharagpur. I have the best Bengali speech to text model. This is the one. And I will put my model here, and it will be the best from Google and everybody else. This student did a project. His model turned out to be the best, better than Google for Google. Right? So now what, what are producers of AI doing? It's exactly what farmers do. They go to a Monday and open a shop. And everybody is there. The consumers of Mandi come to the Mandi and they buy. So it's the same model, right? It's a marketplace and liberalization of AI. And now what will happen? These guys will keep competing. These APIs will become better and better over time because there's competition. <coughs> and this guy is taking money from the user, using five of these APIs, giving that money to each of those APIs. Whoever wins that API keeps getting the money, right? So nobody will go to cattle anymore. If I'm a student and I'm good at vision models, I'll plug them into the marketplace and suddenly I'll start monetizing. You understand the concept behind it? So this, I'm hoping, is going to galvanize the whole AI market. So if you're doing certain kinds of APIs, right, in this whole ecosystem, smart city or smart farming APIs or drone or whatever, you can say, I will want to participate in this ecosystem. And let's see if my APIs are better, then automatically the, you know, the tech Mahindras or whatever, right, who are going to consume it, will start to consume, right? So we don't think that I have to build the whole solution. If I'm only a producer of something, I just produce that. And now I don't have to worry about money and data and customer base and VC funding because I'm immediately monetizing. Right? So let me show you a concept video. I don't know if the video will come. So what we did was, now imagine there is a person in the country somewhere who is passionate about Fisher, Fisher right? And he built a Fisherman app. And this is that app. Huh? What's your phone number? So I want to make this app speech in Yeah, that's my goal. But speech to text and text to speech is only available, let's say, in English. So when I click on Telugu menu or Tamil menu, Choose language. there's no audio What's your phone yeah? number? You understand? This is the state of the app. This guy is only building for he doesn't know speech. Language. But he figured out that unless I put speech first, Fisher will not use it. They don't know how to read all that in any right? We talked about evolution of humans. Now imagine somewhere in the country, somebody who's good at Telugu speech or Tamil speech goes to this website. He has no idea who is out there. All he does is he goes, he uploads a model. And he says, Telugu speech, this is my speech model. I go through the menu system, 
and I have to load a model, you're done. And let's say every night I rebuild my model, and now what happens to the app without downloading? This phone is back. Now it suddenly became PC. You understand the power of this ecosystem? <laughs> where now the app is reading the menu because somebody uploaded a text-to-speech model that can create a model. <coughs> yeah. So that is the potential of how we can together think about building an AI ecosystem in the country. And the guy does not have to download a new app. And the reason is, this app is not connected to Google API or Microsoft API. It's connected to the marketplace API. And as soon as even one person produces that API, it will become an input. That's what will happen. And now imagine what you can do when you have so many startups trying to do this. We can now integrate all the startups into this ecosystem. You do x-rays well, that's your goal. And you do it well, somebody will use it, you will monetize it. Don't worry about finance. Okay? Okay, so that's the idea. And uh, I'm going to take Satish's help and other people's help. And hopefully, I'll create enough excitement in the AI community, in the product community in the country to say, come, let's participate in this together. Because uh, hospital doesn't want an X-ray system only. It wants everything. It is not possible for one startup to produce everything. So you're never going to sell a uh, capability. You are only going to sell a product. Pharma doesn't want only you know, one capability. He wants the whole thing. Nobody can produce the whole thing. So this is the only way possible. And hopefully, we can get that. Right? So the idea is, how do we democratize AI? Anyone can produce AI. Anybody can consume AI. Uh, it is exhaustive. We have identified all the APIs. You can go search and then put it there. How do I consolidate in one place? It is fair in the sense that you have a benchmark data for every API, and you evaluate. As soon as I upload my model, it gets benchmarked against all the other models. And now, you know, I can charge more and less depending on the quality of my model. Right? It is an abstraction, so you don't go to Google or uh, Windows or whatever. You just uh, connect to the overall API. Yeah? So the models the, will keep becoming better. This you, it's already there, or are you just almost working? there? We have we have built the version. Now we are trying to make it easy for people to upload, you know, onboard AI models because AI models can be all over the place, right? Yeah. How do you upload onboard? How do you do benchmarking? And how do you do the logic of exchange, mm -hmm. right? And say, okay, Ola wants to do speech to text in Bengali, and this is the best model at this price. Is it an open source or something you are starting? Ah, so we, we started this, right? So we are going to launch it at some point mm. and announce it, and then we'll have people participate. So currently, we are dog putting it internally. Mm. So we are saying we are the producers of some of the APIs. No, that is from you personally or from Geo or how is that? Right? No, no, this will be for the country eventually. Mm. We'll make it a public thing, okay. right? So I mean, we'll, who is the people behind it? Myself and my team. Yeah, here, here, yeah, right. And eventually, we need regulation and security and privacy and all of that on top of it. So we'll have to work on all that. So there's a long way ahead, but the construct is very solid. So let's talk works. about it because we also are doing some uh, yeah. similar stuff, uh, similar <coughs> ideas and stuff. So let's see how we can follow. Right? Yeah, how we can follow. Right? Right. So the name of the game is: you cannot beat China and US anymore if you just keep doing your own thing, and you have not produced a Baidu and a Google in India yet, right? But together, we can actually change it with this. Yeah. All right. So let me just uh, stop. So here are my final set of things I have learned. So AI is not installed. right? Uh, it improves over time. So you have to keep pushing back at your bosses and say, wait, one more month, and then it will start working. Right? And you have to have faith in that. So you have to have that loop system. Uh, you don't have to think about your own data. You can always augment it with external data, right? So census data. So one example is. If I want to know where to put my next tower in telecom, what is the external data I can get? So I can go to you know, 99 acres and see where the new construction is coming. Right? So it's not my data, but I can draw that. This is how we be creative in AI. Yeah? So what external data am I going to need? Key to data science is not data. It starts with your idea of state thinking. Once you define state, you can work backward and say, what data do I need to compute this state? They work forward and say, given this state, what action should I do? Yeah? Don't build models, build model pipelines. So if you are into data science, right, and these people are in Bangalore know this, that they don't build one model and say, I'm done. They build a pipeline every 3 o'clock in the morning, the system runs, recreates a new model, and puts it together. Right? And don't build a collection of models. Think about the ecosystem of models that we are doing. 
And one thing we talked about, IT thinking is only going to build products. AI thinking is first going to build a sensor. That means you log the hell out of it. Right? So imagine Baidu's, if it is doing this versus this. So today Baidu's is a content company. But when will it become an AI company? So if it can put a camera on the device, which is already there, and can do facial recognition of emotions, and when the kid is watching a video, it is confused. Right? That is sensor thinking. And immediately Baidu's can then pause the video, rewind it, and play it again without the kid having to do it. You understand this? Uh, you know, AI, you know, sensor thinking is the key to building intelligent products, right? And, you know, my last uh, thing is obviously India will benefit from AI, but I think AI will benefit from India a lot, right? <laughs> Getting speech models and all that good stuff, you know, autonomous vehicle in India, right? It's very easy to do it in a lot of places. So, there's a huge benefit of what we are doing. We challenge AI a lot more than what it is challenged. All right, so let's talk about it.